Yeah, so Matt wanted an interesting tidbit. So it's, that's something I started in my astronomy travels was I realized the world has a lot of phantom flavors. Um, they're, they get very odd very quickly. Japan has over 20 flavors. I'm just giving you random information. All right, so I will get started. Um, so I'm very excited to be here. Uh, so I've had the pleasure of visiting Flatiron um, several times um, through my sabbatical. And uh, it's been lovely talking to all of you and I'll be visiting more. So I'm happy to um, chat with you if I happen to miss you or talk to you again. I like, uh, you know, I like catching up and thinking of new ideas. Uh, so I wanted to tell you, I don't want to, I'm good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, I wanted to tell you about the importance and challenges of assessing stellar feedback on the scales of star clusters on up. So star clusters, GMCs, giant molecular clouds and galaxies. Um, and if you haven't seen my talks before, I always start with my conclusions. Um, but before that, I wanted to tell you um, the people who have contributed to this work. Um, so these are the lovely people who are part of my group and have contributed um, postdocs and graduate students as well as one undergraduate. Um, I also have a number of wonderful collaborators who have contributed. And um, some of the work that I'll present here is from the FANGS team. FANGS is the physics at high angular resolution um, of nearby galaxies. And FANGS was initially an ALMA survey, but now we have also taken data uh, with a bunch of other facilities, including MUSE, HST, and now JWST. So we'll have some JWST results here as well. So, all right. So the conclusions for this talk are that stellar feedback, which I define as the injection of energy and momentum by stars is important on both large and small scales. And because it's involved in so many different scales, um, that's one of the challenges um, in terms of assessing feedback, but there are other challenges as well. So the need for observational constraints, the question of where and when energy and momentum are deposited. Uh, and then finally, the fact that there are many mechanisms that must be considered and these mechanisms happen to vary in time and conditions. And really in the last five years, there's been a lot of progress in terms of coming up with observational and theoretical solutions. And so I'm gonna go through these challenges and what the solutions to them are, both from a theory perspective and from an observer perspective. As Matt mentioned, I'm personally observer, but I really like theorists. So I think it's good to talk about both. And uh, in general, my solution as an observer has been to use multi-wavelength observations to assess the comparative role of feedback. Uh, so I started by working on H2 region scales and looking at how these vary with different properties, such as stellar age and conditions. Um, and now I've actually moved on to larger scales, looking at how feedback gets gas out of disks and launches galactic winds, and how on galactic wind scales, um, we're beginning to look at the hot gas properties and getting some of the important constraints there and looking at the relationship between the different phases and how um, it indicates that there is mass loading galactic winds. So that's the sort of play by play of what we're going to hear in the next hour. Feel free to ask questions. Okay, so in general, stellar feedback is important on many different scales. It's sort of one of these very interdisciplinary topics that incorporates basically all of astrophysics. Um, and it was identified in the late 1970s that you need stellar feedback in order to produce realistic galaxies. Uh, and so if you had something that should look like the Milky Way, but you don't incorporate stellar feedback in your simulation, you get a galaxy like the picture on the left. So you end up with a stellar mass and bulged mass that's about 10 times too big. You have too many stars there in the center and not enough gas coming uh, further out. However, if you do incorporate stellar feedback, then it removes gas from the center, produces the extended disk structure, and we get something that looks much more like the Milky Way. So really there's 
a lot of different ways that stellar feedback is important. Uh, besides producing, uh, you know, spiral galaxies, we also need them to produce other kinds of galaxies, such as bulgeless dwarf galaxies. It's important to produce observational relationships like the galaxy luminosity function, the mass metallicity relation, the Kennekit Schmidt relation that regards the star formation efficiency on galactic scales. And then it's also important to produce or lead to the launching of galactic winds that produce pretty pictures like we always see of M82. On smaller scales, which I'm defining here as you know less than 100 parsecs, so giant molecular cloud scales are smaller, you need feedback in order to produce a multi-phase structure of the ISM to get the low star formation efficiency in GMCs to account for the life cycle of GMCs, the fact that they are disrupted and destroyed on tens of mega year time scales. You also need it to drive turbulence as well as to trigger star formation. So there's a lot of different things that come into play. A lot of times when we talk about solar feedback, or at least if you talked about it, you know, 30 years ago, I think people only thought about supernovae as the primary mode of feedback. However, there are many ways that stars deposit energy and momentum. And so let's go through them. So in the star formation process, you have protostellar outflows and jets. These are particularly important in um, star clusters where you don't have massive stars. Then during, uh, when you do have massive stars, then during their main sequence lives, there are many processes that are important, including radiation, both the radiation that couples directly to the gas, as well as the radiation that is dust processed. We have photoionization heating and stellar winds as well. And then finally, in the you know, final throes of a massive star's life, you have uh, supernovae and then cosmic rays that are accelerated by um, the supernova shocks. And I don't. I want to mention here um, cosmic rays because there's really been a ton of work um, in the last five to ten years about the role of cosmic ray feedback. And this is my like little summary slide for like why they're important. So in general, we think that something like 10% of the kinetic energy of supernovae goes into accelerating cosmic rays. Um, I also think that stellar winds and AGN are important in. Uh, in cosmic rays as well. And there's been a lot of simulations uh, incorporating cosmic rays, showing how the different ways that it's important. Um, the first paper that got me excited about the topic um, was one by Craig Booth in 2013, who looked at cosmic ray feedback versus thermal feedback in an SMC-like galaxy and a Milky Way-like galaxy. And you can see automatically that these look very different in their profiles. Um, in terms of you know, what's happening to the gas in the disk, as well as in the outflows. But in general, um, these are sort of the four summary points. So cosmic rays can drive galactic winds. They affect the properties of the winds. So these are going to be cooler, more multi-phase, and accelerated more gently. Cosmic rays in the disk of the galaxy can suppress star formation. And on larger scales, they also influence the CGM properties. You end up with a cooler CGM that is more metal enriched. So I gave no references here. That's because there's a lot of them. Um, and it's especially exploded um, in the last five years, like I said. Um, yeah, that, it's a lot. And I didn't even highlight all of the Phil Hopkins papers. There's really <laughs> quite a lot. Um, I just kind of <laughs> kept adding the letters. Anyway, all right. So, okay, feedback's important. Uh, it's also one of the biggest uncertainties in star and galaxy formation models today. And I think this stems from sort of four different challenges. And this is really like the crux of my talk. And we're gonna go through what those four challenges are and the solutions. So feedback challenge number one is the dynamic range. So the fact that you're dealing with processes that are at the scales of individual stars and star clusters, the star clusters are you know, maybe a parsec across 
then those are influencing the life cycle of giant molecular clouds, which are like 100 parsecs across. And then those shape whole galaxies on tens of kiloparsec scales. So um, in terms of solutions for dealing with this dynamic range observationally, um, it's good to study Milky Way and nearby galaxies where all of these scales are observable. So you can get down to the individual stars, but all the way up to the large scale structures of the galaxies and see the influence. In terms of theory, I think that, you know, getting parsec scale resolution is important. So I think zoom in simulations have helped a lot in order to understand uh, the impact of feedback. So of course, now we're in the era of GWST. And so this is giving us a new uh, resolved view of infrared emission. And so I wanted to mention some of the advances that we've had with JWST, particularly showing some of the new results from the FANGS JWST survey. So FANGS JWST is observing 19 star forming galaxies. 10 of these have been observed already. Um, five have been reduced and the other five are basically were observed like in the last week or two. And so they're in the process of being reduced. Um, the five that we've reduced are the ones listed here, and we've written something like 25 papers on the first four galaxies that were observed on this list, and these 25 papers um, were all published this week in a special issue of AppJ. So um, the, the paper that summarizes the goals of the FANGS JWST program um, was written by Janice Lee. So that's the one to look at if you're like, okay, please give me a summary of what is happening. Um, I don't want to read 25 papers. <laughs> um, but really, as you know, we have a lot of pretty pictures, a lot of data, a lot of different science that we can do with it. Um, so this is one image of a particular galaxy. You know, it looks like a fire simulation, but it's a galaxy, a real galaxy. Um, and so we're doing a lot of different things with this beautiful data. Um, this is a picture of NGC 628, a phantom galaxy. And this is another image from Janice's paper showing the comparison of Spitzer data versus JWST, where you can see the improvement in the data. So um, you obviously see a lot more blobs on the right compared to the left. Um, so we have an order of magnitude better uh, spatial resolution, order of magnitude better sensitivity, and that gives us a lot of capabilities for science that we didn't have before. So one result I wanted to highlight from, from these papers um, was related, related to feedback is looking at bubbles in NGC 628, so one of the targets. Um, and so there's this nice paper by Watkins et al, who um, did an inventory of the bubbles in NGC 628 from this JWST data. She found 1,700 bubbles in the image, and um, they range in size from 5 to 500 parsecs. And so the cyan shows you what these bubbles look like. These were actually done by eye, so you can do uh, a lot more if you did it maybe in a more systematic way. And also this is only from one galaxy. Uh, so I think we're gonna have a very large statistical sample once we have you know, all 19 galaxies or you know, all the rest that will be observed with JWST. Um, so one of the interesting, there's a lot of interesting things here, um, looking at the morphologies of the bubbles, how they're related to the stellar populations, um, their locations in the, in the galaxy, where they are in the spiral arms, um, et cetera. But one thing that I found interesting was that something like a third of these bubbles have bubbles at their rims. So if you zoom into uh, bubble A there, you can see that there's all these little bubbles along the edge. So that's evidence of triggered star formation. Um, you have um, additional new star formation that's occurring um, as the bubbles go outward. And so there's a lot that we can do with this. Um, and, you know, the complementary multi-wavelength data lets us learn a lot about the evolutionary sequence of bubbles and 
and the feedback that is shaping them. Okay, so feedback challenge number two is the need for observational constraints. So we highlighted six different um, feedback mechanisms. And in order to constrain them observationally, you actually need a lot of different observ uh, a lot of different multi wavelength observations. Um, going everything from radio up to x rays and gamma rays. So this means that you need high quality data across the electromagnetic spectrum in order to constrain them. And fortunately, we do have that. So this is another image from um, the Watkins paper that shows all of the different multi wavelength images, which are arc second or better spatial resolution that we have from um, everything from ALMA to VLA to HST to now the JWST images. And, you know, I like to kind of summarize the need for multi wavelength data with this uh, little cartoon of an elephant. And it shows people investigating their part of the elephant um, that's nearest to them. And they think, depending on what part they're investigating, they say, it's a fan, it's a spear, it's a snake, it's a tree, it's a rope, it's a wall. But really, it's an elephant, right? And it's because they're just looking at that one part that they're misinterpreting it. So I think this analogy extends to astronomy because you need multi wavelength observations to get a full view of the elephant. The elephant is the galaxy in this case. Um, otherwise, we're going to think our galaxy is a sphere or a snake or a tree. Uh, so that's why we need multi wavelength data. Um, in terms of feedback, however, there is another way to assess feedback observationally, and that is integral field spectroscopy. So you can actually get a lot of the information um, just from, uh, from optical IFU data as well. So feedback challenge number three is the questions of where and when the energy and momentum is deposited. So the where question comes back to the issue that stars move. Um, we've, we've learned a lot from Gaia, and one of those things is, yeah, stars do not stay in the same place. Um, and in general, massive stars are very mobile. So something like 50% of O stars and 10% of B stars are runaway, which means they move faster than 30 kilometers per second. Um, many more are walkaways, which is greater than 10 kilometers per second. And if you calculate that and say, okay, the typical lifetime of an O or B star is three to 50 mega years, that corresponds to traveling 50 to 500 parsecs before they explode as supernovae. So that means that many of them will actually explode in a very different environment than where they formed. Um, it means their feedback will be deposited uh, differently. And so one example of this, or um, one impact of this, for example, is the higher escape fraction of ionizing photons on massive stars. So there was this really nice paper from 2014, um, which showed the uh, density distribution for runaway stars in red versus non runaways in green. And you can see that the runaways have a much more uniform density distribution which means that they can actually occur in much lower density environments than the non runaways. And this causes, again, for them to have higher escape fractions of their ionizing photons. So the fact that stars move impacts where they deposit and how they deposit um, their feedback. So in terms of theory, I think a nice thing to do is just say, okay, what is the impact on the observables if I shift, for example, where the supernova occur. So there's a really nice paper by Steffi Walsh in 2015, who placed supernovae in different locations. Uh, the top is that they had a random distribution um, in a galactic disk. The middle was that they were um, located at the peak of the density field. And then the bottom is if they were clustered. So 50% were at the peak uh, density field and 50% were randomly distributed. And then she looked at how does this impact the gas in the disk and the outflows that are produced. So these were um, the outcomes from those simulations, looking at what happens to the gas density, column density, and temperature. If you have randomly distributed supernovae, 
clustered supernovae or supernovae that only occur at the peak in the density field. And so you can see that when the supernovae only occur in the disk, you basically have uh, no outflows. Everything is very concentrated. Um, whereas in the random case, in the clustered case, you have much more gas that's able to get out. Um, and these are much more representative of what we uh, observe. So in terms of observations, we can kind of do a similar trick, which is let's just look and see where supernova are in relation to the dense gas from which they formed. And so there's a really nice paper by Ness Maker Chen, um, where she looked at ALMA data, specifically the FANGS ALMA data, and compared um, or looked at the locations of something like 60 recent supernovae and saw how close the supernova were to uh, dense gas, to the CO. And so this is one map example of NGC 4303, where there were many recent supernovae. And, um, but again, she looked at 60 sources and this was the result. So she found that the relationship to the dense gas actually depends on what kind of supernova it was. So 85% of the type 1 BCs happen coincident with uh, CO clouds. 40% of type 2s are coincident with CO. And 35% of type 1As are coincident with CO. So I think one thing that was kind of surprising with, with this result was that type 2s and type 1As are actually not that different. Whereas type 1 BCs, they're really going off in the dense gas. So this is because probably the lifetimes of type 1 BCs are shorter uh, than type 2s. But still, this gives us a, an observational constraint on how many of these different kinds of supernovae are going off you know, within the clouds that form them versus have traveled outside of the cloud before they explode. Yep, of course. So the stars on the rim are going to be younger, are more newly formed. The bubbles can be formed from supernovae or from pre-supernova feedback. Um, so yeah, so the littler ones might be the pre-supernova feedback. Yeah, or more recent supernovae, yep. OK, so let's see. So uh, an interrelated question of where is the energy momentum deposited is when is the energy momentum deposited? And so we can actually try to answer this question observationally as well. So this is a nice paper by Melanie Chavant uh, from last year who took the fangs alma data um, of nine galaxies and saw how disrupted um, the molecular clouds were as a function of stellar age. And so these show the feedback time scale as a function of stellar mass, metallicity, and uh, GMC surface density. And Melanie found that in general, the giant molecular clouds were disrupted on one to five mega year time scales. Now your time scale for like a typical supernova is 3.6 mega years. So that means that if these are disrupted in shorter time, then pre-supernova feedback can be very effective at dispersing these clouds and disrupting them. So pre-supernova feedback um, can actually be pretty effective at, at getting rid of that molecular gas. Okay, so feedback challenge number four was the fact that there are many mechanisms that have to be considered. And of course, you know, this is a challenge observationally and theoretically. Theoretically, um, we can begin to assess the role of different mechanisms by seeing how the different mechanisms, for example, produce different galaxies and simulations. So um, there's been nice work, um, the Aquila Comparison Project, um, the Agora simulations as well. Um, so the Aquila Comparison Project, they did 13 Milky Way-like galaxies and compared their properties at redshift zero to see um, how the properties are different depending on which feedback prescriptions and um, kinds of feedback were incorporated 
And these 13 galaxies were really different um, in many different properties, including that they had a range of stellar masses about an order of magnitude different and a star formation rate about two orders of magnitude different. So this really undercuts the predictive nature of simulations if you end up with a range that is like one or two orders of magnitude. Um, so this kind of shows that the uncertainties, well, it's important to incorporate all feedback mechanisms. Um, and then how you do it, the prescriptions you use um, can actually really change the kind of galaxies that are produced. Uh, so we wanna incorporate many mechanisms. I think there's lots of examples of this work being done from a theory perspective. Um, one that I'm highlighting here is Ronner et al. 2017, who did semi-analytic models looking at different feedback mechanisms and showing how um, the forces for the mechanisms changed as a function of, for example, stellar age, which is the x-axis or uh, stellar mass that's considered. So the top plot is for 10 to the five um, solar mass cluster and the bottom is three times 10 to the seven. And you see that these, which ones dominate actually changes with time. Um, so that's kind of nice, a nice way we can consider the impact of different mechanisms um, from a theoretical perspective. From the observational perspective, again, multi-wavelength uh, constraints are very important in order to have our full view of the elephant slash galaxy that we're looking at. Um, and then we want to be able to do that from many sources so that we can see what the impact is um, depending on ages of the stars, the conditions, the environment, et cetera. So with all that in mind, that was how um, my group began to look at the relative role of different feedback mechanisms in star clusters was to measure the pressures associated with various mechanisms using multi-wavelength data. And so we considered um, a few different mechanisms when looking at star clusters in the Milky Way and the Magellanic Clouds. So we looked at the direct radiation from stars that coupled to gas. You can obtain this by getting the bolometric luminosity of the stars and the placement of them in the star cluster and where the gas is. Um, you can obtain this using optical photometry or using radio observations of the free free emission of H2 regions, which from that you can get the bolometric luminosity. So you either need optical or radio data in order to assess the direct radiation pressure. The dust process radiation, so this is um, you're going to need infrared observations um, to evaluate this term, in particular mid-infrared observations and doing IRFCD modeling lets you evaluate the um, radiation that's absorbed and re-radiated by the dust. If you want to evaluate the photoionized gas that produces a warm gas pressure, which is 10 to the 4 Kelvin, um, in order to evaluate that, you need to get a measure of the electron density of that warm gas. And you can get this from radio or optical or infrared uh, line ratios. And then finally, if you want to evaluate the stellar winds or the supernovae, which shock heat gas, then you really need x-ray observations. Um, so you can do x-ray spectral modeling of the Bremsstrom continuum, and that gives you the density and temperature of that hot gas. So we initially did that analysis back now, almost a decade ago, I'm getting older, um, and uh, measured the pressures associated with these four terms um, for 32 sources in the Magellanic clouds with this uh, range and radius three to 200 parsecs and density of about one particle per cc. And we found that in general, the photoionization heating the warm gas pressure is what dominated. It was 80% of the total pressure, that is the orange points. Then the dust process radiation and the winds and supernovae only contributed about 10% to the total pressure. And then the direct radiation pressure, the blue points only contributed like 1%. So, but really we were interested in seeing how these terms change as a function of conditions and age. So with that in mind, um, Grace Olivier went and analyzed a sample of compact H2 regions um, in the Milky Way and evaluated these pressure terms 
and found very different results. So now we have the Magellanic cloud results on the bottom right, and then Grace's sample on the top left. And she found that for this sample, which is much younger, so you have smaller sources that are still in very high density media, then the dust process radiation is actually what dominates. Um, and it dominates over the photoionization heating, um, the direct radiation. And then we actually weren't sure of the contribution of those stellar winds because none of the sources um, were X-ray detected. So we could only set upper limits on those on that pressure term. Um, but in general, you can see that these pressure terms change as a function of size if we plot them together. And in general, you have that the dust process radiation, the red points dominates until some transition point where the photoionization heating, the warm gas pressure takes over. So smaller sources that are more obscured are dominated by their dust process radiation. And then at a radius of a couple of parsecs, then they transition to being warm pressure dominated. So um, this was a few, since then, a few other groups have done kind of similar analysis on different samples. And so one example of this is Ash Barnes et al. in 2020 did a similar pressure analysis for H2 regions that are in the central molecular zone of the Milky Way, the inner 100 parsecs. And so he measured um, the P direct, the direct radiation pressure and the warm gas pressure pH2 for that uh, sample and then compared it to my sources um, from the Magellanic clouds on the bottom right. So he found kind of a similar trend where you had the radiation pressure dominating and then having a transition point um, where the warm gas pressure takes over. So the other way that one can do this analysis is using integral field spectroscopy. So um, in general, IFU data is very powerful because you can characterize the stellar content that powers in each two region, and then also measure the gas properties, specifically the density and kinematics, and that can give you a constraint on um, the pressure terms from the different feedback. So the first time that I'm aware that somebody did this was Anima Cloud in 2019, who looked at um, a few different H2 regions in the Magellanic Clouds. And so this was the general trend of her results was that again, the warm gas pressure dominated over um, the hot gas pressure and the radiation pressure terms. So again, she's looking at sort of larger H2 regions um, where the warm gas has taken over already over um, the radiation. Okay, so. <laughs> yes, yes, IFU data is beautiful. <laughs> Uh, I believe that it is, yeah. Okay, so um, we are actually now in an era where we can do this from many different sources. So on top of doing surveys with ALMA and JWST, um, FANGS has also done a FANGS MUSE survey. Um, so mapping the same 19 star forming disk galaxies um, and they've obtained 1.5 million spectra for across these galaxies at a spatial resolution of 50 parsecs. Um, this sort of shows you how this data compares to other um, IFU surveys that have been done. So the number of spatial resolution elements has a function of spatial resolution, where the green points represent surveys where you have um, scales below like GMC scales. And then the other points in the right are sort of where you have kiloparsec scales. And so this sort of shows you how the FANGS, FANGS MUSE data lives up that it has a lot of data at very good resolution. Um, and I'll also mention that these data are all publicly available. So if you wanted to go play with them, you could. So, and this is just an example of this um, IFU data, one of the FANGS galaxies 4535, NGC 4535, um, you can get a lot of information about the gas kinematics, the stellar kinematics, um, the ratios of the emission lines, and all different kinds of sources that you, that you could look at. 
in these galaxies or behind these galaxies. Okay, so we have this beautiful data. Now let's go play with it. So Ash Barnes then used the Fangs Muse data and looked at 6,000 H2 regions and measured the pressures associated with these feedback terms. So again, doing a similar analysis, looking at the radiation pressure, the warm gas pressure, uh, in this case, looking at the wind, the ram pressure, and then he also looked at the dynamical equilibrium, the confining pressure. And here, the results actually depended on what assumption of electron density he made. So if he assumed like a smooth electron density, um, which leads to an overall lower electron density, then the warm gas pressure dominates. However, if you assume a more clumpy um, density medium, which leads to higher electron densities, then your terms are a little more comparable. Um, however, it does seem like in general, it's, it's pretty consistent with the previous results that the warm gas pressure is what's, what's dominating in the sample. So that's kind of what's been done. I think in the very near future, uh, we're going to have local volume mapper with STSS5, which is going to be able to do this across a very large sample of local group uh, regions, including the, those in the Milky Way, as well as the Magellanic Clouds, um, and then connect the small scales to the larger scales to understand what's happening. So I think uh, the IFU data there will be very powerful at doing similar kind of pressure analysis. Um, the other area of research related to solar feedback that I'm excited about is actually more related to cosmic ray feedback. So I've kind of neglected cosmic ray feedback besides saying that theorists have been thinking about it. And um, really, you know, I think a lot more observational constraints are needed. And I think in regard to cosmic ray feedback, gamma ray observations are crucial um, because that is where you can observe emission associated with cosmic ray protons that dominate the cosmic ray population. So currently we're looking at it from two perspectives um, on the scales of individual star clusters. We're looking at uh, the gamma ray emission from Milky Way star clusters where supernova have not happened yet. So that are less than three mega years old where um, only stellar winds are accelerating cosmic rays. And we're finding that among these star clusters a large fraction of them are gamma ray emitting and thus are effectively accelerating cosmic rays. And um, that's important because galaxy formation simulations currently do not account for that contribution. So this is an example of one source M17 that we find has a seven sigma detection in gamma rays. Um, so it is accelerating the cosmic rays. Um, we've also started to look at nearby galaxies. Um, so this is the Fermi gamma ray map of the small Angelinic cloud. Um, and you see that it's very spatially correlated with the H alpha um, emission. And so you have gamma rays that are highly correlated with the massive star formation. Um, and we can use the spatial extents to constrain the cosmic ray transport uh, and escape. And these are important to actually test all of that theory that's coming, coming out in the last few years. Okay, so I wanted to switch gears a bit and talk about larger scale feedback. So that is um, galactic winds and outflows. So galaxy scale outflows are also driven by massive stars um, and uh, star formation driven winds are ubiquitously observed both locally and farther out. Um, the prevailing picture is that outflows are driven by hot gas, shock heated by supernovae, that then in train dust, uh, cold and warm gases in the flow. However, um, obviously cosmic rays can also be important in driving winds, um, radiation as well. So there's a, there's a few different possibilities here, but there's many open questions related to galactic outflows. And in particular, I'm interested in it from the perspective of the multi-phase medium and how the hot wind couples to the cooler clouds, how the winds evolve as they go out and how, um, how they effectively transport metals from the disks of galaxies out to the CGM. So in general, um, 
I began thinking about this question like OSU is very interactive and there's a lot of people who work on M82. And so they kind of like indoctrinated me into thinking I need to work on M82. So that's kind of where this all came from. And um, in general, also, um, I realized as they started talking to me about M82 that there's tons of deep X-ray data um, to try to answer these questions. But like the Strickland papers that are like the historical ones that everyone references related to the hot gas now flows, they actually only focus on the central 500 parsecs of, of a galaxy. So like in M82, they only focus right on the center here, but the data is actually deep enough that you can go many kiloparsecs out um, and study the gradients in the properties of these outflows. Um, it's also worth mentioning that the Strickland papers were written in like the mid 2000s. And now the data is like 10 times deeper than it was what was published in the Strickland papers. So there's a lot of ground here that we can, that we can do. So learning that and then also getting indoctrinated into thinking M82 is cool, which it is. Um, <laughs> that's what led me um, to, to looking at this. And so um, in a paper from 2020, I analyzed the Chandra X-ray data. Again, this is 10 times deeper than the Strickland Heckman 2009 work. Um, and what we did was we extracted spectra, um, X-ray spectra across 11 different regions going about 2.5 kiloparsecs out from the disk. And for those of you who don't know X-ray data, um, in general, X-ray CCDs are like IFU um, data where you can actually get a spectrum from any location and then model the spectrum to get the thermodynamic properties of the gas. So it's pretty cool. Um, so these are what the beautiful spectra look like. You have a thermal Rumsterland continuum, and then you have emission lines from the metals that are in the hot gas. So you can constrain the density, the temperature, and the metallicity of this hot gas as a function of um, the distance from the disk. So we did the X-ray spectral modeling of those 11 regions, and these are plots of the metallicity as a function of uh, distance from the disk. So R equals zero is the disk, and then the minuses are going to the south, and the pluses are going to the north. And in general, you see that a lot of the metals, specifically the intermediate mass elements, oxygen, neon, magnesium, are all pretty flat profiles. Um, and then you actually have kind of peaked profiles for the silicon and the sulfur. Um, this is because the silicon and sulfur are mostly come from, coming from the hot, the hottest component, um, which are gonna be enriched by the supernova ejecta, whereas these other elements are mostly being traced by the warm, hot phase. Um, and that's why you're getting a flatter profile for those. So in general, what you see here, is that these metals are being pretty effectively transported out from the disk, right? Like you're having these pretty flat profiles and it's holding pretty constant um, going, going that far out. Um, the other profiles that we produced were the density and temperature profiles. And so these are uh, the plots. You have temperature on the left, density on the right, and the black points are what we're able to get observationally. And for comparison, you have um, in the solid lines, what you would get from the Chevalier and Clegg sort of adiabatic expansion of a, of a spherical wind. And you see that the profiles are much more narrow than what we observe. Um, so in general, this means that there must be other things happening. Specifically, you can have mass loading mixing with the cooler phase. You can also change the wind geometry, um, which has been done in several recent papers by Dustin Nguyen and Todd Thompson, um, where you can get these much broader profiles. Okay, so, you know, after this um, indoctrination of M82 being important, then I was like, okay, there's a lot more sources we can look at besides this one. And so now we're doing this for an extended sample of 16 nearby edge on starbursting star forming galaxies that span a range of conditions in terms of stellar mass and star formation. Um, so these are just some of the pictures of these galaxies. Um, 
some of them have actually really deep data that have never been analyzed. So it's kind of, it's pretty exciting. And so the second one that we turned to was NGC 253. So this is a paper led by OSU graduates and Sebastian Lopez. I was very excited to write a Lopez and Lopez paper. Um, so, woo, life achievement unlocked. Okay, so we analyzed NGC 253. Um, and the blue are the X-ray data from Chandra. Again, I think this is eight times deeper than what had been published before. Um, and so you can see the outflows going. Um, we're able to measure up to like a kiloparsec away from the disk. Um, like our work with MED2, Sebastian went to produce the profiles of the metallicity, um, but also of the uh, temperature and density of the hot gas. And the black points are the profiles that he produced. And again, we see that the Chevalier and Clegg models are giving narrower profiles. Um, you end up with uh, something that is much, that sort of falls off with radius much more steeply than what we observe. However, if you use Dustin's new models, then um, which take into account a non spherical geometry um, and can include mass loading then you end up with these broader profiles like what we observe. So we, as I mentioned, we're in the process of doing this for the larger sample to see how the galactic wind properties change for um, you know, different galactic properties. The other thing we're interested in is understanding the multi-wavelength, multi-phase nature of these winds. And so there's a lot of beautiful H alpha data that has been taken. We're excited to work with Drummond on that. Um, in addition, Alberto Bellato has recently gotten JWST observations of M82 and soon NGC 253. So this is a bit of a advertisement slash, ooh, pretty picture um, from this JWST program where you can see the 3.3 microns, which is tracing the PUS, the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, um, in the disk of M82 um, and its relationship to the hot gas from the Chandra observation, as well as the um, warm gas in HST. And it's amazing because we see these sort of like chimneys of dust features that are coming out of the disk. And so um, it's I don't know what's happening there. And we're basically beginning to do this kind of multi-wavelength analysis to really understand um, how these phases are connected to each other, how everything gets out of the disk, um, and how it's connected to, you know, the stars that are uh, star bursting in, in the disk. Um, the other thing that we're excited to, to look into is actually how metal loading um, changes with different kinds of galaxies, host galaxies, um, stellar mass, as well as the star formation rate of the galaxy. Um, this is a particularly interesting question to us because recent work on the warm phase of galaxies has shown that the metal loading, um, which in this plot increases going downward, um, actually um, increases for smaller galaxies. So they find that in the outflows of the warm phase. And I think we actually find the opposite for the hot phase. And so um, this is sort of to highlight that it's very important to actually get constraints of all the phases, see all sides of the elephant in order to understand what's happening um, and see how effective these um, metals are being transported out of disks, but also what phase they're in um, as they get out of the disks. Um, the other thing that is on the horizon is the launch of CRISM, which is the Hitomi replacement mission. So Hitomi was the, um, the microcalorimeter, extra microcalorimeter that was launched by Japan and then it broke. And um, they basically built another version of it and it's just being launched again. Um, and hopefully will not break this time. And um, the reason why it's exciting is because it is the first time that you can get high resolution X-ray spectroscopy of extended sources like galactic winds. 
Um, and so when you have very good spectral energy resolution, you can go from a spectrum like that's plotted on the top to a spectrum that's on the bottom. So you can actually see these individual oxygen lines. And when you're able to disentangle them, then you're able to get um, velocity information. So we can get another constraint for galactic winds that is not just get the profiles of the um, density and temperature, but also see how fast the material is moving um, and even possibly how fast different metals are moving. And that's just another way that we can um, understand winds better and how they're launched uh, from galactic disks. So CRISM is due to launch um, in 2023, so this year, and we're going to get the first um, observations. M82 is one of the first targets. So I think, you know, we'll e learn even more about the wonders of M82 uh, with those observations. So um, I already gave you my conclusions, so I'm not going to reread them, but um, this is just to say that hopefully you feel now that feedback is important, but there are um, many ways that we can kind of try to tackle it from a theory perspective and from observation and actually put those two things together to learn even more about their impact on, um, you know, small scales up to larger scale. Thank you. And uh, do we have questions for Laura? Uh, Sarah's hand first. Very nice talk. Um, I was curious about the spatial distribution. You were saying about different types of supernovae, obviously exposed to different locations. Yeah. So some can't travel very far. So I was just wondering, are we at the stage now where it's important theoretically to actually distinguish between what type of explosions are happening in randomly distributed versus in the disk? And is that something theorists are already modeling? Yeah, so I think it is important to consider what kind of supernova there are and where they are occurring. And I think, and maybe Matt can correct me, that FIRE 3 is incorporating some of that into the new um, simulations um, that is like the type 1As are more randomly distributed and core collapses are maybe more concentrated in disk, but they are starting to think, take it more into account. So I think that's good because I think it is important and it does change how what what the feedback is doing. Um, so I think people are starting to do it, thankfully, just in the last few years. Um, so Blakesley, and then we'll go with Rachel. And Mordecai. And so some of the UV data is probably like a mix of like Galax and maybe some cost. Like if you had a wide field of view, cost like spectral resolution, the long slit, what would, <laughs> what, what would that enable like in the Ooh. UV? Because I feel like the UV is probably one of the weaker links in terms of the multi-wavelength. That's definitely true. Um, so if you have something like the proposed Hyperion mission, um, you know, what could it probe? And it, let's see, so it was doing uh, the far UV, which is fairly under constraint. Well, I think it is the weakest link, so to speak. Um, like lining and, off a lining continuum, like high spectral resolution. Yeah. So, I mean, I think you're basically tracing part of the medium that you didn't get before. Um, you know, so it's giving you a more full view of the elephant. Um, and I have to think more about what, than what you would learn from it, but I think it's definitely something that isn't probed currently. Um, and so, yeah, I think you'd get more out of it. We'll do Rachel and then we'll go to the Zoom room. So thank you, beautiful work and uh, lovely talk. Um, I noticed that one of the things you did not mention was something that as theorists we obsess about a lot and that's mass loadings and energy loadings. Is that because you think we just can't measure them observationally or just because you made a choice not to talk about that? Yeah, so that's a good question. I think we can constrain mass loading and energy loading, and we just haven't done it yet. But I would like to, I want to, 
I'm talking to Drummond. Um, and so I think, yes, absolutely we should. And, and that is something we want to do in the future. I mean, if we're starting to have this muscle please. Yes. For more galaxies, then we have a great. Yes, absolutely. And Mordecai? Um, if I can ask two questions. The first one is when you are looking at the um, coincidence of supernovae with dense gas, it looked like you were looking at a 2D coincidence. Yes. But of course, dense gas has a very low 3D filling factor. So is a, and if I go back and look at the old paper by Yusef Zada at all, um, that had like a factor of two lower co coincidence factor with dense gas by following masers. So is, are some of these coincidences truly just coincident, line of sight coincidences? Um, what looks like somewhat low resolution for the purpose um, measurements of the dense gas? Yeah, so I think that is a risk and, and um, I guess one comforting thing I can say here is that the FANGS ALMA survey was face on galaxies. So you do have less line of sight effects than you would otherwise. Um, sure. But I think that's also part of the motivation of having a larger sample size is because then you'll be less impacted by, by that. But that is certainly um, a risk is that maybe something is in the foreground um, and, and thus, um, these are maybe these are actually um, limits on what the associate, associations are. As a con just to the contrarian, it is a more actively star forming galaxy than the Milky Way with all these supernovae. So yes, for sure. Maybe it really they really are more associated just because there is more dense gas. Okay. Mm -hmm. The other question I wanted to ask, ask was about your bubbles and bubbles. Um, yep. Were those bubbles identified kinematically with IFU data or just um, by looking for circular structures? That is, are they expanding? Um, so they, I think they did confirm the bubbleness of the bubbles um, using the MUSE data. Uh, okay. So they, they did use some of the complementary information to confirm the, the bubble, bubbleness. Thank you. Yep. Great work. Uh, more questions from the room? Thanks for great picture. Uh, <laughs> also related to the bubble. <laughs> so do you know that these are supernova feedback? Like how do you say that what sort of traces do you know to think that they're supernova feedback? And the reason I'm asking is because of our, like the local bubble with the backyard, like the, the theory is that it is supernova feedback, but we really just don't know. Yeah, that's a totally, that's a very good question. Um, I would say in general, another piece of complementary information that we have is HST observations where we can look at the stellar populations that are powering these bubbles and sort of see their ages and know, ah, yes, they are old enough to have had supernovae occur. Um, so I think that's, that's one of the constraints. Um, yeah, so I would say the complementary information is important there. Yeah. And Larson? I was wondering what the, in uh, Grace's work, you mentioned that most of the uh, X ray constraints are just upper limits. What are the, uh, what are the prospects for actually constraining the X ray properties? I, I was hoping that you would hear me say that. I think I might have even looked at you when I said it. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I think uh, in general, those were 
not relatively deep observations, so we could get it. However, we are limited a bit by the spatial resolution as well. Um, so, but I think it would call for targeting the closer sources with longer observations, and then it could be possible. Anyone else from the room? Perfect. Well, I think that brings us to the perfect timing for the reception outside. Uh, there are food and drinks and plenty of time to chat with Laura and everyone else here. So uh, thanks again for our speaker, Laura.